good morning and a very good afternoon to wherever you are. My name is Stephen Cole, and I am honored to be your moderator for today's webinar, uh, which is entitled Achieving Net Zero with Hydrogen, and is hosted by the El Alatia Foundation in partnership with Refinitiv and LSEG Business. Before we start, I would like to go over a few housekeeping rules for any technical issues during the webinar. <laughs> I've already had a few of those. You can click on the help button. Uh, for any questions for the speaker, you can click on the Q&A. Please note, in the interest of time now, we may be unable to uh, take all the questions you might be asking. During the session, you'll be taking part in polling questions. Uh, and the recording of the session will be available using the same link. The context to begin with for today, with the current situation and international agreements and targets in place, we are in urgent need uh, for the development and deployment of truly a clean fuel such as hydrogen. Hydrogen could be utilized at a high temperature, producing heat and resulting in no greenhouse gases, GHG emissions. This makes hydrogen uh, an ideal fuel for use in hard to abate sectors such as the manufacturing of steel, um, aluminium and cement. Uh, as of 2019, roughly 70 million tonnes of hydrogen are produced worldwide, um, uh, although, and that's every year, of course, although much of it is currently used in oil refining and in the production of ammonia and methanol. According to the International Energy Agency, IEA, demand for hydrogen has tripled since 1975. And today, there are around 50 targets, mandates, and policy incentives in place that directly support hydrogen, with the majority focused on transport. The key challenge with the production of hydrogen is that the cheapest developed industrial process for large-scale production of hydrogen also produces carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. While other processes for making hydrogen may evolve, there is currently only one proven method process with promise and uh, potential for scalability, which is the electrolysis of water. However, the process is energy intensive and requires a clean source of electricity, uh, could be wind or solar, to produce what is known as green hydrogen. This is the key. The IA estimates that the cost of producing hydrogen from renewable electricity could fall 30% by 2030 as a result of declining costs of renewables and the scaling up of hydrogen production. So that's enough of the context. Let's move on to the introductions. Uh, let me introduce to you Frank Wouters, Director, EU GCC Clean Energy Technology Network. Martin O'Neill, VP Product uh, Management, GE Pass Gas Power, Head of GE's Center for Decarbonization. And Jeffrey McDonald, Hydrogen Pricing and Content Specialist, S&P Global Platts. Um, Let's go straight into um, meeting Jeffrey because um, I'd like to invite Jeffrey McDonald for a short presentation on the challenges and the potential future of uh, hydrogen. So over to you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Stephen. I really appreciate the opportunity for how to have to speak today about hydrogen, and uh, I've been part of the, the team at Platts, also working with our analytics arm. Uh, to launch since 2019 when we Platts launched the, the first suite of hydrogen price assessments for the Netherlands and the US. And we, we later expanded those to include Japan and Canada, and most recently for the United Kingdom. So I will discuss these assessments in a moment, but first answer the question, why hydrogen? As Stephen has mentioned many uh, already, um, the, it, the, the most important aspect, and this is the one that affects most of our sectors that we cover at Platts is the word disruption. So we know that, as Stephen mentioned, over 70 million metric tons of hydrogen are produced annually, and most of this goes into the chemical and refining sectors. But carbon emissions from conventional hydrogen production without carbon capture is roughly equal to the carbon emissions of the, United, the UK and the Indonesia combined, according to the IEA. So cleaning up those processes would create significant dent in CO2 emissions, but add to it harder to, to decarbonize sectors such as 
heavy duty transport, sh ships, trucks, rails, buses, etc., along with industry, and you start to understand the buzz around the nascent, this nascent fuel. It's not all about production either. On the consumption Yay. side, hydrogen is a zero carbon fuel. So it's a flexible fuel. It has the potential to disrupt the mobility sector, energy storage, commercial residential heating, and industry. So in a net zero environment, hydrogen could be transformative. So it's easy to understand why Platts launched the world's first suite of hydrogen price valuations in December 2019. It has the potential to impact all of these sectors. And ex you know, to explain our assessments, what they are and what they aren't, um, they are based on cost of production. They're cost plus assessments of hydrogen and what it costs to produce a kilogram or a kilowatt hour of hydrogen in a theoretical production facility. These are not your typical Platts assessments um, based on bids and offers or physical deals. They're spot because this spot market for hydrogen is not yet observable. Rather, they're production cost assessments. They're based on capital and operating expenses, and they, they account for feedstock costs such as gas and electricity, as well as carbon in Europe. So they reflect a snapshot in time of a theoretical long term supply contract across different production pathways, both reforming and electrolysis in all of the different locations. So our production cost valuations are reliable, reliant upon power, electricity, and in some case, carbon data. So these are Platts prices. So we'll launch additional assessments around the world based on available data as, as it becomes available, and also based on consumer de customer demand. So looking at where we are now in the red shaded areas compared with where we plan to have assessments, um, you'll see kind of where we're going in the Americas. We have Chile, Chile with, with abundant sunshine and wind power, has a great potential as a low cost hydrogen supplier. Southern Europe, um, we're also looking at the Middle, Middle East and Australia. Australia could become a, a major exporter of hydrogen as well. And ammonia, we'd like to look at that as we're looking at that as well. And then on a separate path, we're, we're also going to be looking at finding the true price of hydrogen separate from its production pathway. Because at the point of consumption, hydrogen is a commodity. Uh, finding the value of the molecule will be of great value to the industry as the hydrogen economy emerges. And that's the next point that's uh, important. And this is one we've been conveying with uh, industry, governments, and others. Um, looking at, you know, Platts believes, despite all of its great potential, that, that there, there's a chance that hydrogen markets could fail to materialize. So. The current thinking around production pathways and obsession with colors could potentially fracture markets and keep them from getting off the ground. So Platts believes a better way, a better solution exists around carbon, intens carbon intensity, which is the common differentiator between all the different production pathways. I, I should preface this by saying Platts has a history of pricing physical commodities around the world. And this vision of Hydrogen, global hydrogen market development is really based on how Platt sees hydrogen markets developing most efficient, efficiently. It's not a prescription for Platt to take on all of these different aspects of market development because as an observer of the market, you know, we would still expect Platt's to play a role, but it's it's just how we see the markets developing most efficiently, most efficiently over the next decade or longer based on our experience with different uh, commodities like LNG and others. Um, so, as we look at this slide, we can see the different production pathways expressed in colors. There's a different color for every production pathway. And, you know, you, you have, um, you, the, the diff, you know, what we're looking at, rather than asking the question, do you produce more carbon than this threshold, which is what we're seeing in a lot of the guarantee of origin discussions, Platts wants to ask the question, how much carbon and how, and what did you do with it? So the only real differentiator, another, I'm sorry, another uh, differentiator among hydrogen at the molecular level is around purity. And for fuel grade hydrogen, you could see a 98% purity up to fuel cell hydrogen produced at 99.999% hydrogen purity. Um, so as I'll finish up here, a better way to structure the market and create more liquidity could be around these carbon intensity metrics. Uh, rather than associating the hydrogen molecule with production pathway, be tagged with this carbon intensity certificate, which would be separate from the hydrogen itself. And this would be, this would come from an audit function, which we are working closely with a third party auditor, and we'll have some more to come on that, but that would measure the carbon intensity 
uh, uh, based on a kilogram of hydrogen. Um, addition to that, we would see potential for a repository of available volumes, CO2 intensity and offsets, offset activity tracking. So this is for the CO2 certificates that would be created. Um, Platts is looking very closely at, at launching more carbon pricing this year. Uh, and that would, uh, that would also, these could be traded on an exchange um, as either uh, certificates or the physical volumes of, of hydrogen. And I, it should be noted at the at the at the end there is that there is an assessment of physical hydrogen, the, mol the molecule, and we think that would be the best way to create more more a fungible market where hydrogen is hydrogen, and it's really all net zero hydrogen because the the, the carbon would be uh, treated separately. So just a real quick overview of where we're at with our vision around hydrogen and uh, just in general, why it's such an important, potentially disruptive fuel. So I will hand it back over to Dua and then we will go on from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey, uh, for that um, insightful uh, presentation. I love your line about the obsession with colors uh, of, of hydrogen, which I think is quite true. Um, let's move on to our first poll question. Uh, and it is, what will make the biggest difference in enabling hydrogen technology to become more viable? It's on your screen now. Uh, A, making large scale centralized electrolyzers. B, distributing the fuel from the electrolyzers to the points where hydrogen stations are located. Three, fueling hydrogen into a fleet of fuel cell electric vehicles. And uh, I'll just uh, let the, those questions breathe for a few seconds while we gauge your response. And we should see the results uh, on screen uh, in just uh, a few seconds. Let's not forget that uh, we're sticking with green hydrogen, as Jeffrey says, because it is, uh, I think anyway, a major opportunity to decarbonize uh, uh, the uh, hard to abate sectors. And there you have the result. This is what you think. Making large scale centralized electrolyzers, 38.9%. Distributing the fuel from the electrolyzers to the points where hydrogen stations are located um, is the lowest at 27.8. Uh, but fueling hydrogen into the fleet of fuel cell electric vehicles, and that's interesting. Um, that's 33 0.3%. So let's move on to our panel discussion. Those statistics in mind. First question, um, uh, and that is, what will make the biggest difference in enabling hydrogen technology to become more viable? Now, we've heard from Jeffrey, so I will put this First of all, to Frank Wouters, uh, and then to Martin. Frank first. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, two of the three answers, um, you know, point to the use of, uh, of hydrogen as, as a transport fuel, which is, of course, one of the, uh, one of the applications where, where hydrogen can make a difference. But, but there is others. Uh, you know, there is steel making, there's ammonia, you know, the traditional um, uh, hydrogen uh, uses, uh, and those are not part of, of, of those two of the three answers. So my... my uh, uh, you know, click went very clearly to the first one, because one of the one of the things that we have to work on is getting to lower cost, and the lower cost you can uh, achieve uh, in technology, which in the end it is, it's a technology play uh, by just scaling yeah, just, up. Just, we just, just have to make you, more electrolyzers. Just, uh, just to interrupt you a second, Frank, and I apologise for the interruption. Could you turn your camera on? We'd love to see you. Yeah, it's supposed to be on. Okay. Um, let's, let's move on. You carry on, Frank, with your answer, and I apologize for interrupting. Yeah, no worries. So, uh, so, so basically, uh, what we need to do to get uh, to get to uh, a more cost competitive position for hydrogen is just building it, doing it, and we've we've seen that with other technologies. The more you make them, the cheaper they get. Whether it's a smartphone, whether it's a flat screen, whether it's a solar panel, an electrolyzer is not. Uh, not any different. So that is the, 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 the number one thing we have to do is, is build capacity, and then we'll get to cost competitiveness. 
Okay, thank you, Frank. Um, I'm going to put the same question to Martin O'Neill. While Martin is answering, Frank, you may want to just uh, refresh your browser. Uh, but Martin, uh, and, and just to uh, remind people uh, logging into this webinar, the question, what will make the biggest difference in enabling hydrogen technology to become more viable? Uh, so, Martin. So thanks for the question. Listen, I think um, th there's a question of off takers. I thought the question was a good one there with respect to vehicles and transportation. We need more off takers to grow that annual production demand from 70 megatons. 3x growth from 1975 to present day is not going to help us decarbonize, um, hard to decarbonize sectors like power generation, for example. Um, the current installed base of, of General Electric in gas turbines that produce electricity is about 7,000 turbines. Today, if we were to power four of our largest gas turbines on hydrogen from any color, um, that would consume about one megaton um, per annum of hydrogen. So one seventieth of the world's current production would power four turbines. So rapid scalability is really an important subject for us here and, and that really resonates with what frank was saying the other point i would make is right at the beginning of this presentation we used the word urgent urgent and then we used the words cost effective and that suggests to me that we should be having a very buoyant narrative around carbon capture and steam methane reforming to rapidly amplify hydrogen availability at an economic scale that is acceptable, whilst we continue to subsidize and build out green hydrogen infrastructure, which quite frankly has some ways to go to be anywhere close to economically viable compared to other forms of hydrogen production. And just to thicken the plot, I thought Platt's assessment was very good. We understand that the carbon footprint, the carbon intensity of blue is in fact even close or even at parity with green. And there's an awful lot of rare earth materials being extracted to produce uh, electrolyzers, PEM electrolyzers at scale that have certain degradation characteristics. I think we really need to have a much more balanced discussion about low carbon hydrogen in any color being produced at scale if we really want to get after this. Interesting. Um, thank you very much, Martin. Um, uh, Jeffrey, I, I know you made the presentation initially. Do you want to comment on this question? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it's something that Platt Analytics looks at very closely, and they would they would say also say that underlying feedstock costs would have an ever important role in determining hydrogen to make hydrogen more viable. But also to repeat what others have said, it's scaling up manufacturing uh, economies of scale, and I. I'll point to a, a company um, pronouncements about ITM power saying they could uh, reduce their costs per kilowatt from 800 pounds per kilowatt in a few years for a, a 10 megawatt system to 500 pounds per kilowatt for a 100 megawatt system. So you can see where the economies of scale are starting to uh, work with with that with that announcement. It's a, it's a goal. It's not as, you know we'll see how it goes, but that's a that's where you see the some actual data, some numbers, and companies that are putting their their uh, their beliefs behind it. All right, thanks, Jeffrey. Um, second question um, for this panel discussion, and I'll go to Frank first because I think we can see Frank again, which would be wonderful. Um, can we see Frank? And uh, I'm going to ask you first: Hydrogen today is mainly produced using fossil fuels, as we know. Are CO2-free alternatives feasible, Frank? Well, I, I think the. Uh, I mean, in your introduction, you, um, you you answered that question, right? I mean, water electrolysis is uh, and has, has been has been around for for 100 years or so at industrial scale. I mean, the initial. Uh, production of hydrogen it was actually predominantly water electrolysis uh, connected to hydropower in places like Zimbabwe and Egypt and, and Norway. It was only when natural gas became abundantly available that we switched uh, to steam methane reforming. But water electrolysis, we know how to do it. Uh, it it's just a matter of, of, of the cost. 
you know, the, the, the dominant cost of water electrolysis, two thirds is actually the price of electricity. That has come down tremendously. Uh, and if we can, if we can add, you know, cost reduction on the electrolyzer, it's actually a relatively straight chemical process. There's nothing, nothing magic in there. We don't have to reinvent much. I mean, it's just a matter of going out there and do it and the cost will come down. Interesting. Okay, Martin, your view on this? Yeah, um, that resonates with us um, completely. We just, there's a lot of study work that's been done inside of the house in our in our research groups and our modeling and economic evaluation groups. And um, we just think the build out isn't gonna happen as fast as, as the world needs it to. So I think that um, there's a lot of narrative out there in general about colors of hydrogen and which path is best. At General Electric, we believe that deploying the technology that's in our hands today as soon as possible for decarbonization is the right path. So I think steam methane reforms natural gas to produce hydrogen using carbon capture and sequestration um, you know, into depleted oil wells. Uh, carbon can be stored safely underground We've been doing it since the 70s for economic oil recovery in Texas, um, and that's proven. Um, and we can manage, detect, and mitigate the associated risk. Okay, leading um, on, on a path to green. And um, Jeffrey, I, I, unless you want to comment particularly on this year, I think you've probably answered it already, but I. I I'd like to move on and ask you next, how can hydrogen um, contribute to the decarbonization of end uses in various sectors? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, in, in different, uh, you know, looking at some of the different op options, you know, in the fuel side, I mean, you, currently we see hydrogen is really a chemical use, uh, you know, with, with uh, in, in what it can do in, in terms of, decarbonize or well in terms of you know, as a use in in the refining and chem and uh, ammon producing ammonia but uh as as you see new 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 um the development of hydrogen as a fuel uh could could have broad impact in in the transportation sector uh it could be used uh for energy storage as a it, you know to reduce to to uh solve the problem of intermittency as a carrier uh and then also looking at you know from a high heat application uh, in in industry and in building heat and other you know as a feedstock in that sense, so it can really go towards um, you know towards uh, you know, it can it can have a really broad application in, in many different sectors in, in the steel side yeah. and uh, yeah so I think that's it's a broad question I think there's <laughs> it, 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 is, it, it would take probably probably take a webinar just on that subject. Um, but let, let's go back to Frank. Um, what role do you think oil and gas companies can play in the supply of hydrogen? Will they have to change course? Yeah, I, I, I mean, for, for them, obviously, I think it's a natural play because, uh, you know, if, if you see the energy transition shifting to, you know, higher demand for um you know, cleaner fuels, then, uh, you know, you can leave that to somebody else uh, and, and stick stick to your guns, or you can try to, to capture uh, some of that market. I mean, if, if something is going to cannibalize your, your existing business, you better be in that business yourself of cannibalizing rather than let somebody else eat you. So, uh, and we've seen that. We've seen, uh, you know, Total with, um, you know, when was it, two days ago, their new rebranding, uh, you know, Shell, obviously, um, BP, all of them, uh, are, are jumping on this, and for a good reason. I mean, this is this is in the end uh, energy, and it doesn't matter how you make it. I mean, it's different, but you know, you want to be in that in in that business. So you're definitely uh, a play for them. And uh, General Electric, Martin, uh, what role can oil and gas companies play in the supply of hydrogen? I think absolutely, they're, they're going to play a vital role. Anyone who's involved in hydrocarbon extraction has the ability to uh, put carbon in the ground at the same time and, and offset with carbon credits generated. And you've got very low carbon hydrogen in abundance, which bridges us to the availability of green hydrogen at scale. I think the skill sets, the equipment, the infrastructure, 
that you need to do what I've just said. This plays straight into oil and gas companies who are recreating themselves as energy companies and I think want to be yeah. buoyantly involved in hydrogen trading in the same way that there's an LNG market today. There'll be a, a hydrogen market in the future. I think there's a good trajectory here where everybody can play their part and we can decarbonize the world together. I couldn't agree more. Um, uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, so I think you know the Plat Platts believes that uh, the refining sector will have a major stake in the transition. And, and uh, currently, uh, according to our analytics uh, team, the sector is consuming more than 35 million tons per year of hydrogen out of the more than 70 million tons of pure hydrogen globally. So that forecast will be up as much as 40 million tons um, um, by by 2025. So, it, you know, the, the vast majority of this hydrogen is is coming from fossil fuels without the use of carbon capture technologies. That could change when that changes, that's going to make a major impact on the emissions that we're, you know, seeing. So, um, you know, we could we could see an increase of uh, almost upwards of a million tons per year of electrolysis hydrogen capacity between over the next five years and additions of capacity for nearly a million tons of hydrogen produced from fossil fuels and carbon capture in the same time period. So it's a, it's a major impact. It could be, um, you know, driving down the carbon footprint of oil product um, globally would be, would be met, would be huge. What, what uh, Jeffrey, do you think are some of the most uh, important hydrogen projects currently under development? Well, we've, I mean, the majors have already launched a few in, in early June this year. Or well, last year, sorry, the Shell announced it was it was doing a 10 megawatt of electrolyzer capacity at, at its Rhineland refinery in Germany. And these these electrolyzers are, are, are producing uh, zero carbon renewable or green hydrogen to the two to upwards of 1,300 tons per year uh, to offset its gray hydrogen. It's still a small percentage of their refining process, but it's just in the in the demonstration phase. So, you know, the next stage will will increase the production by by an order of magnitude with the addition of another 90 megawatts of capacity. So, projects like that, there's BP has other, you know, in Lingen, and uh, there's uh, you know massive offshore wind projects around uh, the North Sea that we're looking at. And it's just, um, it, you know, and, and it can go around the world. But for the most part, they're in industrial uh, sector. Um, but you also see a lot of transportation projects as well. And, and Martin and Frank, so, uh, do you have anything to add to that, the most important hydrogen projects happening now around the world? I think we're in a phase of demonstration. I, I think, quite frankly, um, the faster we can scale up and really point, once we can get out of sort of five megawatts here, 10 megawatts there, once we can start producing literally hundreds of tons of hydrogen per hour, then we can start to get excited about usage in transportation and offtakers in power generation. That's the scale we need to get to. So everything we've just heard, we need to 10x it as quickly as possible. And, and Frank, anything to add to that? Well, I mean, I was I was uh, involved in uh, in in the strategy around the uh, the neon project in Saudi Arabia, and one of the um, you know the first projects they're they're constructing now, and this is pretty pretty well advanced. I mean, they're looking at financial advisors and, and bank financing this thing. It's a two point two gigawatt uh, electrolyzer in in neon. It's a joint venture with the Air Products, Aqua Power, and Neom, uh, and they're going to make uh, four thousand tons per day of of green ammonia. Um, at, at a scale that we haven't seen before. I mean, we're talking 10 megawatts in Rhineland. That, that was the biggest electrolyzer uh, before that. And now we're jumping from uh, from that to 2.2 uh, gigawatts, 2,200 in, in one go. And this thing is being built, uh, being developed as we speak. And we, you know, they've started they've started ordering equipment. So it's going to happen. So we already see that that kind of scale. And this project's also uh, fair to say that with the price of carbon, it, it doesn't require subsidy. This, this is already in the money. And, and I want to stay with you, Frank, because um, uh, I'm going to ask one more question before we go to the second poll that we've got, and we'll talk about that afterwards. Uh, but before we go to that second question, the 
follow question, which jurisdictions are establishing standards for the hydrogen economy. And what do you think we can learn from these initiatives? Yeah, and I'll ask I think Frank and uh, either Martin or Jeffrey, but Frank first, uh, about what we think. First of all, it's the gas quality um, uh, that, that's all over the place. But, but more importantly, it's the carbon, uh, the carbon content. So people are working on uh, so-called guarantees of origin, which dictate, uh, you know, the life cycle carbon content of, um, of, of the hydrogen. On the guarantee of origin, you can, you can actually certify uh, a product. And then as, as Jeffrey uh, showed in his slide, you can actually trade uh, the green quality or the whatever color you like to mention uh, of, of the hydrogen, independent of the physical flow of the molecules. Uh, I think it's also fair to say that with, uh, you know, more than half of all the global projects uh, currently in, in some advanced stage of development are in Europe. Europe is also leading in that respect. And, and that is something that, um, you know, I think this region, specifically the Middle East, the Gulf, uh, who are building capacity to potentially export, they need to be part of the conversation. Uh, and, and that's what I keep telling people here. Don't let it. Uh, to a uh, you know well-intentioned um, uh, European uh, consultant, in the end, have to have to have to work with, uh, be part of that conversation right now. But it's happening in Europe. <laughs> okay, I'm going to add to that that basically Japan is also uh, looking at uh, is doing a lot of long-term projections and breaking down costs, but putting hydrogen on par with natural gas. So it's it's. Um, I think from uh, and this goes back to your question about the um, big projects and just trying to establish a supply chain um, that, that leads into, it leads into the country, um, you know, bringing, you know, it's, it's doing a lot of uh, ramping up those shipping lanes, lanes over time. Um, so Japan is, is doing that like it did with the LNG markets over the last decade. Um, so we're seeing, I think the, um, you know, the, the, some of the, some of the supply, you know, some of the, the work that they've done in this project in, uh, in Australia, um, you know, with, with the Latro Valley importing, uh, importing uh, hydrogen produced from lignite coal, uh, sequestering it underground and then shipping it to Japan has to be compressed to very cold temperatures. Um, and it's, it's getting closer to launch. That, that will be an interesting uh, project to see in terms of the uh, gasification and hyd hydrogen refining that takes place in Australia. You've got liquefaction and storage at the port of Hastings and then transportation of this liquefied fuel to Japan and then unloading it at and it when you re, when it re, re, arrives there so there's many different aspects of that the government has been encouraging um, you know this cost reductions over time so I think that's going to be a it's going to be a critical part of that over you know to, that other that other that other um, others can learn from as, as your original question asked yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, let's let's move on to this second poll question. Um, here it is: Which area of the hydrogen economy should governments prioritize? And hopefully, we'll see that on your screens. I just repeated: Which area of the hydrogen economy should governments prioritize? Uh, the first option is hydrogen production. Second is transport. Third is domestic heating. Fourth, there it is on your screen now, storage. And then others you might th think of. Which area of the hydrogen economy should governments be prioritizing now as we move towards greener years to come? Hydrogen production, uh, transport, uh, domestic heating, storage, and others. I reckon I can anticipate <laughs> the, the winner of this one. But uh, we'll just see until we get um, your reaction, which is which is absolutely key. Uh, and then uh, I will put the result of that poll to Frank, Martin, and Jeffrey, just a reminder of uh, who we have with us. Um, Frank Wouters, director of EU GCC Clean Energy Technology Network. We have Martin O'Neill, VP Product Product Management at. Uh, General Electric Gas Power, uh, head of GE's Center for Decarbonization, and uh, Jeffrey McDonald, Hydrogen Pricing and Content Specialist, S&P Global Plants. So that's taking... Ah, there you go. 
spot on. Ah, well, I don't think, gentlemen, that the results of this will come as any great surprise. Um, Frank, I can see you. What do you reckon? 62% for production. Yeah, I guess that's that's not a big surprise. I mean, uh, in, in terms of, um, uh, you know, the question, um, uh, what, what's what's often more difficult at this point in time is actually the offtake, so the application. Uh, you know, many people know where to make hydrogen, how much will cost, et cetera, but then what to do with it, who is going to be your client, at what price point, and, and why. So in terms of getting this market going and getting to the scale, which, uh, you know, provides for cost competitiveness, you know, there is a role of, of the public sector, of governments, uh, to make that happen. Uh, and I, I think it needs to be an across-the-board effort. Uh, I mean, storage is, for example, something in an energy system always difficult. Uh, typically, uh, you know, something that's part of, of a regulatory regime, so it's regulated business, especially if it's piped, uh, if it's piped molecules, uh, then that is very difficult to do that in an open setting. But you can do that, but uh, typically that's that's a government-led uh, kind of thing. Especially and, and also transport. I I wasn't sure what this meant, whether it was uh, transport fuel or was it was it transporting the molecules? Because the infrastructure aspect of hydrogen is another big play where I think governments uh, have a decisive role uh, to to get us there. To to, to get us. If if I look at Europe, two hundred thousand kilometers of high-pressure gas pipes. The transition from you know fossil fuels to, to green hydrogen in that system is not going to happen uh, with with private sector uh, efforts alone. That is a big, big government play. And Martin, Martin O'Neill, what do you reckon to this uh, response? Good. I think it's the right response. First of all, um, and again, I think off takers for me would be the next thing that needs to be solved. But hydrogen is hard to deal with in terms of storage, safety, detection. But they're solvable problems. But I think really the off-takers, we're, we're predicting massive hydrogen growth. We're talking about the economics and the scaling and the, and the government incentives that are probably required to support that. Um, I think we need to make sure that you know, supply and demand somewhat match. The logical off-taker for, for me personally is um, I like what I'm seeing in the mid-distance mid, mid transportation sector in rail and road. Um, I think hydrogen. I think hydrogen for transportation is a good way to scale an off-taker. Um, so, interesting. Okay, and um, Jeffrey. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's right. I mean, this is where Platts decided to launch its production cost assessments, where where we thought there would be the most value in terms of uh, transparency of what the the costs were. Those those will be a big difference differentiator for. Uh, moving the markets forward in the short run, I think policymakers will need to will need to provide that the the support uh, to as costs are driven down and and manufacturers scale up their uh, their product um, and that's you know that's going to happen I think over to get to get to get where you need to be you need to have you know to have the the uh, you know it's going to before it gets, you're going to need to encourage the consumer as well. But I think the um, the production side uh, to, to to come up with those subsidies or, or contract for differences that would um, you know get as we're starting to see carbon prices go higher. I think um, you know there needs to be that's one form of of uh, encouragement <laughs> to um, to start looking at you know to bring to narrow that difference between conventional. Hydrogen production and and um, cleaner production. All right, thank you, Frank Martin and Jeffrey. I want to go to um, our audience now and just take a few questions in no particular order as they have come in. Um, Jorge Cantonet, please address ADNOC's plans to build a world-scale blue ammonia project and the implications for the emerging hydrogen market. Who wants to pick up that ball? Well, I will say Maybe that Platts is looking at ammonia pricing uh, down, and that should be starting uh, soon. We're looking at that that type of pricing, so that would be of interest to us, of great interest, especially in the Middle East, Australia, and other parts of the, around the world. Okay, and Jeff, um, just to build off that, I'm, blue ammonia is is clearly interesting as a carrier fluid 
for hydrogen. And I think a lot of people are concerned about how to transport large volumes of hydrogen around the globe in the same way that we do with LNG today. Compressing hydrogen so that it liquefies requires an enormous amount of energy. Um, you're, you're moving towards, you know, um, almost uh, minus 230 degrees C, which is another 100 degrees C less than the energy it takes to liquefy natural gas. So carrier fluids and how to move and export hydrogen as part of ammonia around the world. That's interesting. Hydrogen, ammonia combustion has its challenges. Um, I think this will be a developing area of research and demonstration. Okay, thank you. Um, a question to Martin uh, from Tanzim, uh, Tanzid Alan. Surely it's easier to decarbonize power generation through renewable energy uh, and not use hydrogen? Yeah, so a lot of the narrative that we're all reading um, out there in trade press and LinkedIn feeds and various it tends to focus on generation technologies. And the journalists tend to focus or renewables or nuclear or gas or coal. And then it likes to label who's good and who's bad. And then suggest to the audience that we should prioritize one technology over another. Um, the reality of life is that electricity grids don't work like that. And there are certain features of rotating assets in terms of how, how electricity grids actually operate, how they provide frequency stability, how they make sure that grids are resilient um, and that we balance economics with resilience, with sustainability, that narrative isn't getting out there. So I think that truly people are not understanding the role of gas synchronous rotating assets versus renewable alternatives. If we can get coal off grids fast, and actually retire coal and replace with gas to provide minimum grid inertia and frequency support, gas actually acts as a force multiplier to accelerate renewables additions onto grids. And that's a narrative that I really invite people to think more about. This is not an either or discussion, and it's being massively oversimplified by the media. That's because the media don't fully understand the issues, I suspect, speaking as a member of the media. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Tim Patterson has a question. The poll missed early adoption and use of hydrogen. Internal combustion engines can be retrofitted right now. What does the panel think about this as a transitory step to bringing the cost of hydrogen down by building capacity in the production process? Who wants to pick that up? Is, is that a question for vehicles yeah. or what, what kind of internal combustion engines? Yeah, because he's I mean, most transport. I mean, there's a, num a number of well, there's a number of there's a number of uh, of car manufacturers that toyed with that idea in the beginning, uh, but but retrofitting obviously also comes at a cost and. Uh, in, in, in the end, um, retrofitting existing vehicles versus uh, just switching to a new one, uh, I think it will always be a niche. And uh, if you if you then look at the uh, the efficiency uh, equation, a uh, fuel cell is just uh, way more efficient than uh, an internal combustion engine. If you make make a whole lot of sense, it's just better if you if you want to you know drive on hydrogen, use a fuel cell. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um... Before I move on, anybody else want to come back on the transport uh, in hydrogen and the production process? If not, I shall go um, to this, to Frank. This question is aimed at you from Mazam Salah. Several Gulf countries such as Saudi Arabia, Oman and the UAE are beginning to develop national hydrogen policies and hydrogen production projects with an eye on supplying Asian and European markets. Do you think there'll be enough demand for hydrogen from these markets in the future?
Yeah, I have, I have no doubt. I mean, if, uh, I mean we've done a, a fair amount of, of thinking about Europe. And if you look at, um, you know, what does it mean, uh, net zero carbon in 2050? And 2050, mind you, that's less than 30 years uh, away from now. That, that is not, you know, the basis of, of Europe's energy system will be electricity um, because, you know, it doesn't have much hydrocarbons. You know, you buy natural gas from Russia and, and, and oil from elsewhere. Uh, so switching to something that you can either reduce yourself or, or choose whom to buy from uh, makes a lot of strategic sense. And in my view, if, if you look at the options, you can do um, you know, a whole lot more biomass, you can do carbon capture, or you can base, uh, to a large extent, your system on, on uh, green electricity plus hydrogen uh, made from green electricity. There's just no, no space in Europe to, to, to make all that uh, in, in Europe. So that's why Europe is also looking to import. Uh, and, and this region, um, you know, it's close by, it's not too far away. Uh, you, can, you can potentially even pipe hydrogen uh, to Europe. And then the numbers are massive. I mean, if you're thinking, um, you know, potentially half of Europe's final energy with hydrogen, then, then and half of that would be imported. Those are massive, massive numbers. You're talking several thousand steroid hours of, uh, of hydrogen that would have to come from either North Africa or the Middle East or even further away. Uh, so I have no doubt that, um, you know, this is certainly, you know, business of the future. And, and Martin, what industry do you think will be the, the, the driver for a widespread uh, hydrogen economy? Hmm. So, <laughs> again, I tend towards... <laughs> Obviously, you, you outlined the major consumers today, you know, in, I would say, oil cracking, enrichment, treating, um, and ammonia production. In the future, I hope that that would shift to transportation. And I think, ultimately, there is a role for ingestion of hydrogen in, in turbine technology. Um, and obviously, our, our turbine portfolio can combust gaseous fuels such as hydrogen. Um, the physics works, the, the combustion works. There's no problem there. Uh, I just think that there's a, this intermediate step. I'm, I'm hoping it's transportation. Um, the two hard to decarbonize sectors there are transportation and power generation. People often believe that we're solving transportation by electrification, but what you're actually doing is you're moving more stress onto the grid, onto the generation sector. So even if you drive an electric vehicle, if your grid is 40% coal, then you're not actually helping because we're just putting more terrible hours of stress onto the same grids. So ultimately, hydrogen for decarbonization of rotating assets so that we can maintain grid stability and some of the issues that I pointed at, I think that will come, but that's probably the third or fourth domino to fall. And uh, Martin, staying with you for the moment, GE currently has a 50% hydrogen uh, capability for combustion in its largest baseload gas turbines and is working on advancing this percentage towards 100% uh, by 2030. Getting there, though, will require a rapid scale up in the production of clean hydrogen. What do you think will enable that scaling up in production? I, I've, I think I've hinted at this a few times in the discussion already. I, I honestly think that carbon capture is going to be a technology that unlocks uh, hydrogen futures at scale. It also protects synchronous assets on the grid, gas turbines today, whilst we figure out the right economics to be able to ingest and combust hydrogen for power generation. Um, some of the economics that we're talking about here, we need to be careful with units. Again, I often see different colors of hydrogen compared to each other based on dollars or euros per kilogram. We need to be mindful of the fact that when we're in a combustion event, we're actually interested in the energy content. Um, so we need to be thinking about millions of British thermal units to do a fair comparison. And right now, hydrogen in any color um, the cost point is significantly higher, a full order of magnitude and more than natural gas. And even with the best economic extrapolations of green hydrogen, it's going to be something like five to seven times more expensive than natural gas is today by calorific value. 
we really need to deploy carbon capture to protect rotating assets on the grid. And that means that blue, blue hydrogen production is going to be the first domino to fall, in my opinion. And we need to have as much of a robust discussion about that as we're having about green hydrogen in all parts of the world. I read about green, green, green. I really yeah, think we owe it to ourselves to shift narrative to blue as well. Very interesting. Good, good way to, to, to finish this discussion, I think. Thank you, Martin. That's very interesting. Um, I'm going to wrap this up now, but before I do so, again, many apologies for the delay of the beginning uh, of this webinar. It was purely down to uh, technical signals uh, in London. So I apologize for that. Um, I don't want to, I don't think I need to remind you all that everyone, uh, that we all have, the world has just 29 years left to meet the 2050 deadline agreed by almost 200 countries in the Paris Accord, uh, and that accord aimed at limiting the global rise in temperature to below two degrees uh, centigrade. Although there are numerous strategies around, I think the overarching approach will see each nation limiting and offsetting greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And for many countries, I think that may well uh, end up uh, costing their economies, which is already suffering, many are suffering from the pandemic downturns. Um, there is therefore, I think, an urgent need for the development uh, and deployment of a truly clean fuel such as hydrogen. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending this webinar series, supported by the Alertia Foundation in partnership with Refinitiv and LSEG Business. Thank you and goodbye.